When I began working as an artist in the late 90s, my practice was mostly oriented towards conceptual photography and the extra photographic. But in the year 2000, I inherited a photographic archive from my grandfather, J.R. Plaza, that allowed me to take another path, one that was still more focused on ideas rather than on formal intuitions, but also one that was going to mark my main approach to photography, which is through appropriation and recycling. Having in my hands almost 4,000 pictures related to my family history allowed me to almost never again have to worry about taking photographs. That archive was for me, especially at the beginning, like a double of the world. Everything I needed was there. All kinds of backgrounds, of faces, of ages, of emotions. So, I worked with this material for 20 years, trying to exhaust the visual possibilities that this collection offered me. But at one point, I decided to explore new territories of photography, and I left the archive resting in my studio. Until some months ago, while listening to one of my favorite jazz albums, Giant Steps by John Coltrane, an image came to my mind, a sort of photographic collage that my grandfather made in the 60s, where he appears sitting on a small staircase with an expression of strong disillusionment and pointing a gun right into his head. This, of course, was supposed to be funny, and it still is. His silhouette has been cut out and pasted on a cardboard where he drew a gridded chart with a red marker showing a graph going deeply down, surely the opposite of giant steps. On the right side of the grid, some dates appear, 63, 64, 65, 66. I don't know what happened during those years, but clearly he must have felt terribly, although hilariously, frustrated. Somehow, this image appeared in my mind as a jazz album cover, because everything matched. Those were the years when the jazz industry became synonym of the most radical and avant-garde ideas, in music, of course, but also in graphic design. The covers of the best albums of that time, released by Atlantic Records, Blue Note, Prestige, and many other jazz labels, were authentic jewels of visual communication. In no other field had photography, typography, and illustration been so freely and inventively fused as in those hundreds of staggering 31.3 by 31.3 centimeters squares. I have always admired the use of photography in those albums. Its refined sophistication and boundless creativity remind me of the best works by John Baldessari and other artists from the conceptual era that used to combine masterfully photography with other media so as to produce images that are as engaging and visually powerful as the best covers of Joe Henderson or Dexter Gordon. I have been wanting to work with this material for years and also I was looking for an opportunity to work with the collection of self-portraits of my grandfather, a selfie artist avant la lettre. Besides being a very handsome and photogenic man, J.R. Plaza was a committed self-portraitist that pushed to the limit his acting and modeling skills and even worked on elaborated settings in order to pose as, among other characters, young Wayne in a cowboy style. It is clear that he had in mind movies and movie stars 
when he put himself in front of the camera. It is a mystery who took those numerous images of him. Maybe no one, but he surely knew how to put on an act. I have always been fascinated with the originality and appeal of these photographs that appeared intermingled in the archive with much more traditional family pictures. And this was finally the occasion to delve into his multiple personae and celebrate him as an involuntary identity artist. Also, this has become the time where I can finally work with my beloved jazz album covers, where portraits of musicians are treated not only as authors' references, but as a visual element with which to play with. What amazed me was that for each cover portrait I saw, from intimate close-ups to full body frames, there was an equivalent portrait in the J.R. Plaza archive that was as cool and as stylish as the originals. So, this triggered the game of equivalences that ended up forming the set of 60 jazz covers from the J.R. Plaza archive. And this also brought about the second work of the show, which is titled Soundtrack for a Steel. There's a wall in my house where an image has hanged in the same spot for years, an image that it's already fading away due to time and light. It has become kind of reddish. It must be a picture taken around the 60s as well. It's a portrait of my father at his 30-something in the Piazza San Marcos of Venice, kicking a group of dopes that are now flying all over. Because of the movement of the birds, my father's face appears a little blurred, but you can tell he's happy and his action is not a violent one, but more like a dance step. He's there wearing a big coat, dancing like Fred Astaire. This image has always made me think about music. This is not something that happens to me with any picture, but there are some that are asking for a soundtrack. They are clearly steals of an action that should be accompanied by a tune. And this one more than any other, perhaps, because my father was, among other things, an amateur trumpetist, madly in love with Gatto Barbieri, a jazz tenor saxophonist whose albums my father played, they tell me, over and over and over. And since this show is about music and images, I decided to include it, but it needed a soundtrack. So I asked five friends and relatives with whom I share the jazz enthusiasm to pick one piece that, for any reason, made them think it could perfectly work as a soundtrack for this precise steel. My father and my grandfather are both dead now. This show is a tribute to both of them. Because they love jazz, because I love jazz and because they are an inspiration to me.